welcome to my ranking of films which came out in the year 1989, or at least the ones that I've seen. And I can reveal I have seen a whopping 28 films from this particular year, but I'm not going to be including all of them in the list because some of them I can barely remember, even though I know I've seen them. So this is going to be a ranking of 25 films, not 28. The three that I'm leaving out are Major League, Fletch Lives and Peter Pan. Now, I'm pretty sure I've seen all three of those films, but... I have no memory of them. There's nothing I could say about them. They probably would not chart very high as a result. So we're going with 25. Now, before we get into it, a quick reminder that the top film today will be going through to the eventual grand final of 100 films, where I will be declaring once and for all what the greatest film of all time is. The film which comes second today may also qualify for the final, numbers permitting. So let's get into it and find out what is my 25th favourite film that was released in 1989. This is about a group of people who are secretly aliens and they like to eat people alive. It's not as good as it sounds. I, I remember being quite bored watching this when I was a teenager. It does have an absolutely batshit bonkers final scene, but I found it quite mean-spirited. I didn't really enjoy it. I certainly didn't find it funny. The only thing about this film I enjoyed really is the song that plays on the end credits. I think they they did a song specifically for the movie. I thought that was that was a nice touch to throw that in there. But the actual movie itself just feels like it's trying too hard to be a potential cult classic. And I've never gone back to it in 25 years or whatever it's been. This is another one I haven't seen since the 90s. It's a kind of domestic drama, black comedy about a warring married couple played by Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner. I'm sort of surprised that they did this, given the fact that they'd only really just finished Jewel in the Nile and Romancing the Stone. Did they really have to keep on being in every single film together? I know they had a great chemistry in those other films, but were they dating or something in the 80s? You know, was it a bit like the, the Clint Eastwood, Sondra Locke sort of deal where they just had to keep being in the same films? I, d I don't know, but... Certainly, I don't particularly like this one. It's a very unmemorable film. It has a very unsatisfying ending. But just for the fact that we don't have to watch Michael Douglas eat Kathleen Turner from the inside out, I will at least put it ahead of society. This is one which always seemed to be on TV when I was growing up. I can remember trying to watch it many times, and I think I only got all the way to the end once, which is not a particularly great thing to be able to say about it. I don't remember that much about the story. I could easily have left this one off the rankings as well. But there are two moments in the film which I do remember. One of them is when this funny middle-aged guy is trying to gamble with dice or something, and he's like, come on, Daddy needs some new pants. And then some kid ends up shooting him in the head, I think, for some reason. And there's another scene where Eddie Murphy shoots some fat woman's toe off or something. That was quite amusing. So, yeah, little bits here and there I remember, but I, I can't even remember what the point of the film was. <laughs> Yet another one I haven't seen since the 90s. My abiding memory of this film is Christian Slater getting his middle finger blown off towards the end. That was just gross because that is not a finger you would want to lose. When I try and think of what fingers I I could lose and be okay with it, I, I think I would probably go with one of one of these two on the end. I don't think you'd want to lose any of the other three when I, when I, when I think about it. Most of the rest of the film is quite good. I remember enjoying this one. I, I just felt unsatisfied with the last sort of 20, 30 minutes. Uh, by the end of it, I was kind of like, yeah, it was all right. So, Heathers gets a fairly low placing from me. The Karate Kid 3 attempts to copy the first film, but it's not that good. Only the first two Karate Kid films are good, in my opinion. But I believe in the Cobra Kai TV show, there are some characters in that who originally were in the Karate Kid 3. So I think if you're going to watch the whole series films and TV show. I think you still have to watch number three, potentially, but it's not a very good one. The only scene I can remember being of worth is when Mr. Miyagi goes to the dojo and knocks out about three bad guys in one fight. But apart from that, this is by far the weakest of the original trilogy. 
When I was younger, I watched a whole bunch of films that I had no business watching, being the age that I was. The Fly 2 was one of them. I went to a fairground once and all I could think about throughout the day was the fact that the previous night I'd seen some guy get his head squashed like a watermelon underneath an elevator. And it's not ideal for those sorts of images to be in a kid's head when you're trying to enjoy a day trip. But it's not a bad sequel, actually. It does nothing new, you know, but it's entertaining. I've seen it at least a couple of times. And I like the ending that the villain gets in this. I mean, that is the way to properly give a villain his just desserts. And if I was going to go back and watch the first of these, the classic original with Jeff Goldblum, I would definitely follow it up by watching The Fly 2 as well. This is another one I've only got a vague memory of. I believe it stars Michael J. Fox as a soldier who refuses to take part in a load of gang rapes which are going on in Vietnam or somewhere. It's not really my sort of film. It's very sad. It's a little bit bleak and depressing. It's not the sort of thing I would ever really watch more than once. I'm not saying it's a bad film. Possibly there are real life issues in this which needed to be highlighted and talked about, but I, I, it's been a long time since I saw it and I, I probably won't watch it again. This was a bit of a famous one in my house when I was growing up because I rented it when I was about 13, really enjoyed it, but my dad happened to watch some of it and he did not like it as much. He made jokes about it, took the piss out of it, said that it looked like it cost about 50p to make and for years afterwards it became like a running thing that if a film was bad my dad would then say oh it looks like it was made by the same director as Cyborg or oh, this is even worse than Cyborg. I tried to watch it a second time much later in life probably late 30s and I finally saw what my dad meant because in the first five or ten minutes I was like whoa god this film looks cheap I totally did not spot this when I was 13 but it, I, I should have gone on and watched the rest of it I, I didn't actually I turned it off after like 10-15 minutes I, sh I should have gone on because it, it is a fun little action film albeit on a budget there's this one insane moment where Van Damme he sort of wedges himself between two walls with his feet and has this knife and as the guy walks beneath his legs Van Damme just swings the the knife down in an arc and stabs him in the face they, I don't think you actually see that but there's a few cool little action-y bits in this film from what I can remember. And like I said, it, it was always a famous film in, in our household. This is a bit of a turnaround because in my 1988 rankings, Halloween 4 came second and still has a chance of being in the grand final. Today, Halloween 5 has only come 17th. Yeah, it's a very disappointing sequel for me. I don't think I'm alone on that. I do have some very weird movie opinions at times, but Halloween 5 is one of those occasions where I am more or less with the crowd. I've talked about this film a few times already on my channel. I've done a full review of Halloween 5, actually. You'll find that in my Halloween playlist. Classic movie. I think I've only seen this first one. I, I may have seen the second one as well, but I don't remember that. And I've certainly not seen the newer one, which came out recently. It is more my taste for characters to take time travel seriously, a bit like Marty and Doc do in the Back to the Future films. But Bill and Ted are who they are. If they were more serious as people, they wouldn't be Bill and Ted. You know, people love them because they are aloof and a little bit silly. So I, I can't really knock this film. It is a good time. I've seen it twice, I think. Um, so... Given the fact that this is not usually my sort of movie, I think it's done pretty well today. This is a low-budget action film starring Keitha Sutherland and Lou Diamond Phillips, who just a year previous to this had starred together in Young Guns. It's a kind of team-up movie, I guess, where these two guys from different walks of life have to take on these villains who for some reason remind me of the villains from Raw Deal. It's, it's a fun little 80s action film and I would absolutely watch it again if I saw it on TV. This was an attempt to make an Aliens type movie at sea, albeit on a budget. I, I don't remember this one being particularly great. You know, I, I rented it rather than watched it on TV. 
I had an okay time. I've never gone back to it in all the years that have passed between then and now. I guess I could watch it once more just for nostalgia. I think Peter Weller might have been in it, one of the few other films that I've seen him in apart from Robocop. I hope I haven't got that completely wrong. But yeah, Leviathan is is all right, I suppose. Sylvester Stallone has done quite a few films throughout his career where he's ended up in a jail cell or a prison. This is one of them. Although, like the film Heathers, I remember this for a very silly reason. So there's a scene early on in Lock Up where Stallone arrives at the prison and this guard gives him two toilet rolls and basically tells him that if those run out before the end of a month, then he's going to be using his hands to wipe his ass. Now, it's hard for me to imagine that this would have been a thing even in the strictest prisons in the USA in the 80s, but I have occasionally over the years remembered that scene and wondered to myself, could could it be done? Could you make two toilet rolls last a month? It's my brain sometimes, I swear to God, but this film's all right. It's no Shawshank Redemption, but I remember it being, being pretty entertaining. I think this placing means that both Ghostbusters films have finished outside the top 10 for their respective years. I do like them, though. I might actually prefer this second one to the first one, not that it's got any right to call itself the better film because it does copy the first one for the most part. I don't mind them continuing to have ghost stories in New York all the time, but I think we could have done without Bill Murray romancing Sigourney Weaver all over again. Why couldn't they have just been a married couple at the start of this second film and then we could have had a slightly different dynamic? I love the stuff with the, the Statue of Liberty at the end of this film. Vigo the Carpathian is a great villain. And me and my dad used to love the bit in the train tunnel for different reasons, admittedly. For me, it was just a great horror moment. You know, anytime you've got characters going down into abandoned tunnels and it's all dark and stuff. Brilliant. I, I love that sort of thing. And my dad, my dad loved that moment because of when uh, Winston comes out with that line where just after the train has gone through in the ghost train, he says, sorry, I missed it. When uh, the others ask if they got, if they got the registration number of the train or whatever. So yeah, that was a, a, a favorite part of the movie in our household. The Ghostbusters 2 is fun. It, it's a good time. If you're really going to analyze it, it is a copycat movie of something we've already had though. I'm surprised this one hasn't made the top 10 because when I first started to think in my head what films would be on this ranking without checking, Batman was one of about three films that immediately came to mind. So I thought it would be up there in the top five, but as I got into it and, and actually started writing films down, I, I realized that there's just loads that I like better than this. The first time I watched Batman on a rental in the early nineties, I was really impressed with it. it. It was just the sort of grown up film that I was craving for at that age. It feels like a real world, this, uh, that, that's within this film. You know, bad things can happen, people can die. Has there ever been an end to a Batman film as good as the Clock Tower stuff in this? You know, the Joker gets a great death, there's some funny moments, there's some great fighting. I just wish they'd gone on to make more films like this in the 90s and not some of the silly ones that they started making. This might be controversial, giving Star Trek V a berth in the top 10 at the expense of films like Ghostbusters 2 and Batman, but I really enjoyed this when I watched it for the first time only a couple of years ago, I think. I'd heard really bad things about the film. I'd, I'd, I'd honestly heard it was absolutely terrible, but to my surprise, I just thought it was a really enjoyable Star Trek adventure. I loved all the stuff to do with the, the camping trip that some of the characters go on at the start. All that God stuff honestly never bothered me. I, I just watched it and enjoyed it and had no complaints at all. And honestly, I, I probably liked this one more than Star Trek VI, which I watched just a couple of weeks after I watched this one. So, yeah, I know a lot of people say that the even-numbered Star Trek films are way better than the odd-numbered ones, but I, I liked Star Trek V. What can I say? <laughs> So here we have the second Michael Douglas film on today's ranking. This is way better than War of the Roses, though. He plays some kind of cop who has to go to Japan and get embroiled in a story involving triads and Japanese gangsters and things. But 
Michael Douglas doesn't play some guy who can improbably martial art people to death. From what I can remember, he has to get through this film on his wits and his determination. It's been a while since I saw it, but I've seen it at least two times, I think. It's very good, this. It's got a good story. It's very gritty, very well made, albeit not very well known. This is a coincidence because it was just the other day I was watching a review for this on one of my favourite YouTube channels, Derek's Horror Corner. Very good channel, by the way, especially if you like horror. This is a cop buddy film similar to Lethal Weapon. Honestly, if you like the Lethal Weapon films and you've never seen Tango and Cash, what are you waiting for? You will absolutely enjoy this film. And there are two amazing actors in the lead roles, Kurt Russell and Sylvester Stallone in the same film, working together as cops. They've got a great camaraderie. They have to go to prison at one point. There we go, another prison film with Sylvester Stallone in the same year, in the same ranking, that's funny. I think the main actress who is, who is like the love interest, I think it's Terry Hatcher, but I'm not sure on that one. Maybe this came out too early for that to have been her. I'm not 100%. I, I do know that Jack Palance is the bad guy, and there's also Robert Zadar, he of Maniac Cop fame. He plays a thug in the prison who makes the two leads' lives in absolute misery and then gets a much deserved death by electrocution. If you've never seen Tango and Cash, absolutely give it a try. You will be more than entertained for the two hour duration. It is a forgotten 80s gem. I used to think this was the best of the Back to the Future films. I'm not so sure now because I've got a real bee in my bonnet these days about films which don't finish properly. They just set up another film which you have to wait a long time for. Back to the Future 2 is absolutely that. The end of this film, all it does is set up the next one. But it's so great up until then. It's such a clever film. The time travel stuff is complicated but easy enough to understand if you're following it properly. I had no trouble understanding everything that was going on at 12 or 13 or whatever it was, whatever age I was when I first watched this and I watched these films a lot growing up. I mean we would watch the Back to the Future trilogy at least once a year throughout the 90s. There's so many funny things in this film, quotable lines. I love all the stuff that happens in the future. The the, the little pizza that goes in the microwave and she's like, hydrate level four, please. And it comes out a massive big pizza. And then um, Marty getting sacked from his job when Noodle Needles comes on the screen and he's calling him chicken. So he commits some sort of fraud. And then later on, uh, one of my favourite moments as well is when Marty goes back to the bad version of 1985 and he finds the Biff Tannen Museum and there's all these clips of Biff winning his millions and he's like, uh, in 1986 he invented Biffco and he's stood outside of petrol station and stuff. If I was going to mention every funny thing in this film, I'd be here all day. It is a really great, fun movie with the slight caveat that it doesn't really finish properly but yeah talking about it now I almost wish I'd put it higher than seven maybe <laughs> so if you don't know this is a thriller about a holiday in couple played by Sam Neill and Nicole Kidman they are in the middle of the ocean somewhere and they pick up this guy who is seemingly lost at sea but it turns out he's not who they think he is at first and they are very quickly in a battle for their lives with this guy. You, you don't know right up until the end of this film whether you're going to get a happy ending or not. It's a very tense thriller. I, I, I feel like it's another one of those films which is kind of forgotten. I am partial to films which are set at sea. I, I love that sense of space and scope that you get with the distant horizon and stuff. I can feel it through the screen. I really like that stuff. And this is a good one. I, I, I feel like revisiting it now, actually. This is my personal favourite of the Lethal Weapon films. I don't know if that's a popular opinion or not, but I think the series was still really fresh at this point. They hadn't yet got to that point that I feel they, they got to with the third one, where they were just too self-aware of their own success, maybe, and... The comedy stuff started to get a bit much. I, I think they got the balance just right in number two. It's, for the most part, a very serious thriller with just, you know, sprinkles of comedy throughout. Plus, you don't get all that suicide cop stuff that you got in the first half an hour of the first film, which is fine the first time you watch Lethal Weapon 1, but I think on repeat viewings, you just kind of want to 
skip through it as quick as possible just to get to the good banter and the action but number two is just great right from the beginning right to the very end if i have one gripe about the film it's that i don't think they needed to kill off the patsy kensick character i forget what her name was in this um it's completely gone from my head but i don't think riggs needed to be getting revenge for two different women in the same film. I think that was just overkill. I think they should have kept this girl alive for future installments. It, by the time that Riggs started dating a cop, I think that was just Hollywood bullshit. Do you know what I mean? Um, but I still love this film and it's so emotional at the end when you realise that Riggs is still alive and he cracks that joke and then the music comes on. It's just a brilliant ending. So now we've had both Timothy Dalton James Bond films, neither of them have made the grand final, but they're both very solid films. Licence to Kill can easily compete with any Daniel Craig film, in my opinion. I've got a little bit of a sad story to tell about Licence to Kill. I think I've told this story before on the channel in one of my James Bond related videos, but to hell with it, I'll tell it again. So. When this film came out in the cinema, my family surprised me one day in the kitchen and said, guess what, tonight we're taking you to watch the new Bond film at the cinema. And they all sort of beamed at me as if I was going to jump up and, you know, act all excited. Instead, I just looked at them and said, I'm nine. It's a 15 certificate. And they were all like, what, seriously? So it's a good job that I knew. Otherwise, I would have had the heartache of turning up at the cinema and then being told by the reception desk that I would not be allowed in. But yeah, I, I bless them, I guess, for, for trying to give me a, a good thing that night. So yeah, License to Kill, it, it's a great film, I, I think. And one of my favourite parts in it is when Bond has to pose as a waiter and then shimmy down this building and he's got this explosive toothpaste and he has to put it in front of the, this armour plated window uh, to, to then blow it up so he can try and shoot Sanchez from across the street. That whole section is just a great bit of spy work that he does. They should have more of that stuff in modern day action films. I feel a little bit relieved that this film has not finished in the top two. I think if Jason Takes Manhattan had made my top 100 films of all time list, I would have felt slightly embarrassed and almost as if people would not be taking the list seriously because most of the world hates this movie. I love it. It's one of my favourite slasher films of all time. I've done a full review for it. You'll find it in my Friday the 13th playlist if you want to hear me defend the film vehemently. But for now, let me just say that I've not deliberately left this outside the top two. If this had been the 1988 rankings, I think it would have come second behind Die Hard. I absolutely would rank this ahead of Halloween 4, which came second for 1988. As it is, this film is in the 89 list and the two films that we have yet to come, I, I think it's the right choice to put those two films ahead of Jason Takes Manhattan, but it wasn't. A far off thing. This this film could have made the final and, and didn't quite, but yeah, I, I'm a Friday the 13th Part 8 fan, a huge Friday the 13th Part 8 fan, and I'm not ashamed to admit it. So our first probable qualifier for the grand final is The Abyss. This is not one of James Cameron's more celebrated films, I don't think, not in the same way that Aliens is or The Terminator. This is more of an acquired taste. It is a bit of a slow burn, but like I said earlier in the video, I love stuff at sea, whether it's under the waves or over the top of them. When I was a kid, all the stuff in this to do with Ed Harris being guided by that alien creature through the underground city of lights, that absolutely blew me away. Probably it wouldn't impress youngsters today as much, but there's other stuff in this film which is so enjoyable as well. And I like the fact that this film doesn't take liberties with realism it constantly feels like the characters are in danger of drowning. There are characters who just go stir crazy. The Benz is a possibility in this film. It feels like a real expedition under the sea that these characters are going on. And it's not really until late in the film that the, the alien thing becomes more of a presence that it goes towards science fiction. I'd, I'd really love to get a Blu-ray for this. I don't think one exists, and that's why currently I don't have it on my shelf. I think I've sort of occasionally thought about buying this, and it's just not been available on, on anything but DVD. James Cameron is not good for releasing stuff 
True Lies is in a similar situation right now. I think very, very famous film, but not available on Blu-ray for, for whatever reason. Get it sorted, Cameron. I like to think that people watching this will think that for my number one, I chose wisely. Yeah, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade is a great closing chapter for the trilogy as it was for the longest time. I went to see it in the cinema with my gran when I was eight, I think. A very special memory for me. There are so many funny things in this film. The guy in the castle who says, this is how we say goodbye in Germany, Dr. Jones, and then punches him out so funny. And on the air balloon when he kicks the German out the window and then looks round at everyone and they're all staring at him. So he says, no ticket. It, it's just stacked full of great stuff, honestly. And I'll name one more brilliant moment. At the end, when the villain drinks from the wrong cup, he undergoes this transformation into basically a skeleton. But there's one little frame of that transformation where I swear he looks like Christopher Lloyd from Back to the Future. And I can't watch that now without thinking of Christopher Lloyd. I can't watch that moment without thinking that. And I've got to give credit where it's due. I did not originally come up with that. It, it was somebody on the YouTube channel, Valverde Broadcasting, one of the main presenters on there. They are, they are funny bastards on that channel. I'll always give credit where it's due, but I, that just cracked me up when I, when I first heard that. Uh, not, not sure you'd call it a joke. It's more like an observation. But on the whole, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, the bee's knees, it is the winner of my 1989 rankings. It's going to be very close, I think, between the three indie films once we get to the grand final. I don't think the three of them will be that far apart from each other on the list, but we'll see what happens when we get there. Still a long way to go. So for now, there is one more question left to ask today. I've got three films for this section today. Firstly, Lonesome Dove, which I believe is an outstanding Western. I like Westerns. Secondly, Amityville 4. I've seen the first three and quite enjoyed them for the most part. Thirdly, the original Puppet Master, which I believe came out in 89. I did see Puppet Master 2 when I was a teenager and I quite enjoyed it. So it is definitely on my mind, actually, to have a run through the Puppet Master films very, very soon. I might even think about reviewing them. But anyway, that's all for today. Going through to the grand final, we have Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade and The Abyss. Probably. I'll be back soon with my first rankings video from the 1990s. How exciting. Until next time, cheerio.